Thank you, Charlie and, and Ainsley, and uh, for, for inviting me. It's great to um, be back. I used to, um, many years ago, be a DPhil student here at Tiddy Hall, um, studying a rather different sort of thing that I'm going to be presenting uh, today. So today's talk is, is really just a, a quick summary of some of the work that's been done on the, um, in, in experimental psychology primarily on the perception of uh, biological motion. And Stephen Mottram has presented some lovely um, examples of how um, just from a few moving points of light we can uh, quite easily um, um, perceive uh, a, a, human, a human form a human moving form. Um, so this set of dots here doesn't look much like um, a, a person's body, um, and you, uh, if, but if I, or even if it's a uh, from a set of movie clip, it's a short movie clip. If I took a set, of, another frame um, from another part of the movie clip, you still wouldn't be able to see much in the way of human form, even though you still now got some um, top-down knowledge of that probably does represent a body. But if I play it as a movie clip, you can see um, somebody basically doing a, a, a digging action. Um, if I show you another movie clip um, that now looks a bit more like um, a, a human body, certainly if you've got the knowledge uh, to begin with that it is, um, and there we can see um, it's somebody walking, doing a single gait cycle. So these stimuli have been created um, by uh, in various using various methods, um, and the, I'll, I'll briefly summarise what those methods are shortly. Uh, the point of doing this, one of the main points of using these point light stimuli, as they're called, is to um, get rid of most of the body form information, body information about body shape, information about the face, um, and just so we can focus on um, the contribution of motion to our ability to understand human movements, human actions, and as we'll see, um, perhaps also to some extent emotions and personality traits from the way somebody moves their body. And this work um, originates primarily from um, the work of a, a Swedish psychologist, Johansson, back in the 1970s. What he did was attach uh, uh, points of light or markers, um, reflective tape, for example, to uh, the joints of people in the format that you see in the figures on the right. So we, one method was attach small lights to the joints of the person dressed in dark clothing, and another one was to wrap strips of reflective tape around the joints the, uh, from the person in dark, in dark clothing. And then video record the movements in either of these cases, and to do some video editing afterwards, such that um, uh, all you are left with are uh, these white, white dots, um, typically white dots, moving against a dark background. And um, here's a, a, a summary sentence from his paper. He found that 10 to 12 such elements, um, inadequate motion combinations, evoke a compelling impression of human walking, running, dancing, and so on. Uh, <coughs> so. Um, these days, of course, we've got um, uh, more sophisticated methodologies for creating these uh, stimuli. So motion capture um, data that's motion captured labs that have been used in the gaming and film industries quite extensively um, now use, typically use, uh, well, there are various ways of doing it, but one of the most common ways is to use these infrared markers that are placed strategically on parts of the human body and uh, films with uh, infrared cam cameras. So the 3D positions of these uh, locations of these uh, uh, white markers are tracked over time. And then you can reconstruct um, a human body uh, from the, or, or, or at least reconstruct the motion of a human body afterwards from the uh, movement of these uh, markers. And you can do things like animate um, uh, avatars, or you can create uh, from the motion data that you've captured um, these point light displays. And uh, the filming industry, film industry has made good use of the motion capture uh, to, uh, for example, here Andy Serkis, of course, famously has played Gollum uh, in a motion tracking. You can also um, do motion tracking of movements of the human face, even though the face moves in a very different way from the body. The articulation motion of the body is very different from the surface changes of the skin uh, and muscles when you, when you move your face. But um, 
sometimes use, use different techniques, but put, um, you can create uh, facial animations through motion capture uh, this way as well. Um, so one of the ways to study the contribution of motion to our perception of um, human mo movements um, while controlling for or eliminating uh, body shape information is to create these point light displays. But one of, one of the things I want to just quickly mention is another way of doing that, which is to have a standard shaped avatar, like something like this, for example, which is fairly um, identity neutral, gender neutral, and so on. And you animate it with essentially different motion capture, the motion capture information from different people. And um, so you can make it move in various different ways. So this is um, an example from Rother and colleagues, uh, Martin Gieser and colleagues in Germany, um, and, they, and uh, they, they get various information from this uh, in relation to uh, joint angles and, and so on uh, uh, as well. So my work in this area started back in uh, shortly after I, uh, two or three years after I left uh, Titty Hall, and I went to the University of Winchester. And uh, the psychologists Andy Young and Vinan Dittrich got in touch with me and said, hey, are you interested in, 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 in uh, studying the perception of emotions from body movement? Um, why don't we get together and create a, a, a set of uh, body movement stimuli that, it, that uh, people would perceive as expressing certain emotions? And we, um, given the limited resources and money that, that we had at the time, uh, we did it in what, what I sometimes call the Blue Peter fashion, um, which was basically dressed people up, uh, students at the University of Winchester, uh, we dressed them up in, in dark grey clothing um, and attached strips of tape to their bodies in, in uh, strategic locations, usually um, well, in, the, in the same locations as you usually see uh, in these point light displays, so around the um, ankles, knees, hips. Uh, wrists or hands, elbows, uh, shoulders, and also uh, one on the head. And we filmed them expressing um, uh, emotions. Uh, in we just gave them fairly free reign to say, okay, express, uh, give an expression of what you think somebody would act like when they're angry, when they're happy, sad, fearful, disgusted. Uh, we also did some non-emotion, so-called non-emotional actions uh, as well. And we, so we just did a simple, um, yeah, so that, that's on, on a loop. Um, that's somebody just expressing anger, somewhat uh, symbolically perhaps. Um, but it, it, we uh, also created, uh, using simple video editing techniques, what I'm calling patch light displays, which is, I think, the second method um, that Johansson used. So here we, um, we just had uh, the white strips of tape um, visible, uh, the rest of the body is not. So you can see this is exactly the same uh, person uh, doing exactly the same movement. Um, and subsequently, um, so my initial work was with these stimuli showed um, that people were quite good at um, judging what emotions were expressed in the stimuli when we gave them a set of what, forced choice emotion labels, angry, disgusted, happy, sad, um, fearful. Uh, so given that forced choice, people were really quite accurate, sort of you typically 70, 80, 90 percent accurate on average at, at, at judging what emotions are being expressed in both these types of display. People tend to be a bit more accurate here um, in these sort of displays than these ones. There's less information, but they're still really quite accurate uh, at judging emotions in those displays. Subsequently, a subsequent work we've gone on to um, with help from um, uh, my former Durham colleague Hannah Smithson, who's now here at Oxford. We created point light displays um, rather than these patch light displays, but it, it, again in a fairly simple fashion by tracking the motion in, um, on the computer screen of, of these dots, recording the uh, XY coordinates, and then creating these point light displays based on those X, 2D uh, coordinates. So again, we see the exact same uh, motion there. 
And that doing this allows us a bit more flexibility. Well, one thing it does is, is um, uh, there's less sh body shape information than, the, the, than in these patches. But it also allows us to do things like um, <coughs> scramble, scramble the dots, scramble the spatial position of the dots, um, manipulate them in various ways in order to be able to um, uh, study various aspects of um, what, it, what are the, the features of these stimuli that allow people to see them as moving human bodies and that also allow them to make judgments about what emotion is in, in the stimulus, for example. So, all sorts of work going back from, uh, to Johansson and other people's work in the 1970s has shown that various characteristics of humans can be reliably inferred from these point light displays of body movements. So um, we, should, we should note, also, though, that there's a distinction here between reliability on the one hand or consensus or consistency of judgments across uh, people, across different people or within the same person across different time periods versus the accuracy of those judgments. How accurate are they um, at judging whether that person really is, um, does have these characteristics. So sex uh, judgments, whether the person's male or female, typically reliability and accuracy go together. Um, people tend to agree what looks like a female walking, what looks like a male walking, and um, uh, those uh, judgments that tend to be accurate. Um, age, people can usually distinguish um, just from walking motions in these point light displays uh, the relative age of people but not necessarily very accurately the actual age of those people. So older people obviously have uh, different types of gait, than, different aspects of their gait than, than, than younger people. Identity to some extent can be judged from these simple point light displays. So. Uh, at least uh, people tend to be um, best able to distinguish um, uh, very familiar people, including them sit, walk the, the gates of themselves in these point light displays, uh, than, than as compared to uh, people they're unfamiliar with. And emotion, personality traits, um, I'll talk a bit about um, in, in the rest of the talk, and also um, actions and social interactions, which is what I'll briefly end the talk with. So um, just to illustrate some, some work going back to Troye, uh, uh, really quite um, excellent work he's done here on, which I can demonstrate, I hope, through this web page, that he's got this lovely, um, okay, so it's not showing on the, I just have to turn this off. Ah, uh, okay, so that's not going to show, unfortunately, it seems. Never mind, I'll skip that and come back to it later. So, right. So we know that um, uh, looking, we'll f focus a bit more on emotions, perceptions of emotions from these body movements. We know that humans are quite adept at, at judging the so-called basic emotions like anger, fear, surprise, happiness, sadness, um, from static body postures, from arm movements uh, alone. So um, Pollock and colleagues, for example, have created point light displays where um, simple arm movements of making a, a knocking movement um, or drinking movements was the other one, um, that various aspects of the, mo the way people move can be interpreted um, uh, as expressing um, or, or leaking uh, a particular emotion. Um, whole body movement work that I've done amongst others, uh, when Ann Dietrich um, did some uh, work on the perception of emotions from dance movements as shown in point light displays um, and showed that people are able to distinguish between different emotions depending on the way people dance. Um, also, just simple walking movements, so walking in a particular way um, to, uh, that, that expresses in some way an emotion. 
Uh, so various studies have, have shown that. Um, some of my work showed that, for example, as we increase the level of exaggeration of the movement, um, people tend to be, observers tend to be more accurate at judging what emotions are being expressed, except in the case of sadness, where sadness is um, characterized by smaller, effectively less movement, less exaggerated movement. So people are more accurate at judging sadness um, when it's less exaggerated. Uh, we also, but uh, sadness and all the other emotions um, were rated uh, as being more intense um, where the more exaggerated the, the uh, movement was. Um, I've also gone on to do some work with um, a PhD student, a former PhD student at Durham, where we had people, we, we motion captured people walking across a room and we um, uh, had, we, we created these point light displays of that and then we had people, observers, judge the personality traits of these people uh, on the so-called big five personality traits primarily such as extroversion, introversion um, and uh, adventurousness and things like that. And um, so here's one walker and here's another. Um, we, so they're fairly simple movements. We got people to just judge you know, what rate the personality traits. And then we found that people tended to agree quite well on what, um, what, what sort of walking styles looked more adventurous, for example, or more approachable or more extrovert than others. So, but those uh, ratings of, of personality traits weren't accurate in the sense that they didn't at all correlate with the self ratings of the, of the people who were doing the walking. So the people who were doing the walking uh, also filled out questionnaires about their own personality traits and there was no relationship at all between uh, the way those about those self-reported personality traits and the, and the perceived personality traits of these people doing the walking. But what we did um, was then do some uh, statistical analysis of the motion of the uh, dots over time in, the, in these point light displays of these gates. And we, um, so we, we found some so-called principal components in the principal components analysis that we did. Uh, that seem to correlate with the observer's ratings of the uh, uh, personality traits. So there's a, the first principal components that, that, um, of the motion seem to um, uh, correlate quite highly with some of the traits, particularly adventurousness, uh, extroversion, trustworthiness and warmth. Um, and then what we did was manipulate, exaggerate or decrease those uh, uh, that principal components of the motion. So we had, it's not very clear from here, but we had this, uh, we, we sort of essentially de-exaggerated the principal components of the motion over here on the left, or exaggerated it here on the right, um, which doesn't seem to be moving, unfortunately. And then we asked a new set of observers how to rate these personality traits of these walkers. Uh, these walkers were seen individually, one at a time, rather than a sequence like this. What we found was that those, at least for some of the personality traits that we got them to, to, to rate, um, those, there was a linear relationship. So the, when we exaggerated that principal component of the motion uh, of these walkers, we managed to increase the ratings of the, on these personality traits. So we could, um, that was direct evidence that these personality, the, these, this component of the motion is, in, is very important in our, um, our ability to perceive what, uh, or what it is to infer the um, uh, personality trait of these uh, people walking. And the thing I'll, I'll finish up on is just a brief uh, mention of some work that I'm beginning on which uh, with a colleague in, in Newcastle <coughs> University, following on from some work that um, some researchers in Germany have done, which is on the perception of social interaction. So most of the work that's been done using these point light displays has been done on uh, inferring uh, characteristics of individual people and individual actions. What happens when you've got two people, two or more people interacting? How um, are we, for example, better at judging um, the social interactions as compared to when uh, two people are acting individually? 
So we're using stimuli like these where um, person A here is, is essentially giving um, an instruction to person B um, to do something and person B does it so that uh, person A here was uh, was giving an instruction to, to take a seat and person B takes a seat. Um, we compare those uh, stimuli with this condition where um, person B is doing exactly the same motion, taking a seat, but person A here has um, done something, an action that's completely unrelated. And we do various experiments where we look at um, are people better at making judgments about stimuli, uh, whereas the social interaction as compared to these conditions where um, there isn't uh, an obvious social interaction. And uh, the work of the German groups has shown, for example, that um, in these com communicative actions, people are more accurate at um, um, judging whether person B is there or not amongst a, a, a bunch of uh, randomly moving noise dots as compared to um, in the individual condition case that the second uh, movie clip that I showed you. And indeed in a subsequent follow-up study they did, they found that um, similar relationship here in the dark bars, um, healthy control subjects, but uh, individuals, adults with high functioning autism didn't show that um, uh, advantage for uh, communicative interactions as compared to individual actions. And uh, I also mentioned just some brain areas that are involved in perception of biological motion, such as these stimuli. Um, particularly along the peritemporal sulcus region, uh, but also in, in, in um, uh, more prefrontal cortex regions. Uh, and these re brain regions are uh, part of a larger system of brain regions that um, are involved in processing various aspects of these stimuli, and perhaps we can, we can talk about that uh, in more detail later. Um, but also uh, other work has shown that just to connect with the social interaction work, people have shown that very, uh, these set of brain regions um, are involved in, in also processing social interactions. So there's something about um, these, some of these brain regions at least that as it were um, uh, prefer the social interactions as compared to the individual actions. Okay, so I think my time is up. Um, I will I'd like to uh, uh, thank my collaborators and students over the, over the years um, in this work, and I'm happy to discuss in more detail uh, a lot of this work uh, later on after, after the talks. Thanks very much.